Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Welcome, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you to the 2010-2011 Millennium Lecture Series. Before we begin, I'd like to express appreciation to the co-sponsor of today's lecture, the El Paso Collaborative for Academic Excellence, and its executive director, Dr. Susana Navarro. Susana, thank you very much for all you do. The theme of this year's Millennium Lecture Series is issues in U.S. public higher education. We've invited distinguished speakers to share with us their perspectives on such issues as closing educational achievement gaps across demographic groups, preparing a competitive 20th, 21st century workforce, serving as a catalyst for regional economic development, and developing more sustainable funding models. With us today is a very special friend of the University of Texas at El Paso, Katie Haycock, president of the Education Trust, an organization that works to boost academic achievement among students from kindergarten through college and to close the gaps between opportunity and achievement that often relegate too many low-income students and students of color to lives on the margins of American mainstream. Based in Washington, D.C., the trust has been a powerful force in education policy since its inception in 1996. It has been described as the most important truth teller in American public education. But this organization is more than a watchdog or truth teller. It works hand in hand with educators and civic leaders to proactively transform schools and colleges into institutions that best serve all students. Katie Haycock speaks about educational improvement before thousands of educators, community and business leaders, and policymakers each year. She mentioned to me today that she actually spoke to a group not too long ago in Artesia, New Mexico. Now you have to be dedicated to your message to go all the way from the El Paso airport to Artesia, New Mexico, and we thank you for that. She has received numerous awards for her service in behalf of our nation's youth, and she serves as director on several education-related boards, including the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, the New Teacher Project, and the Hunt Institute, which is Governor James Hunt in North Carolina, not Woody Hunt in El Paso, Texas. A native Californian, Katie Haycock founded and served as president of the Achievement Council, a statewide organization that provided assistance to teachers and principals in predominantly minority schools to improve student achievement. She also served as Director of Outreach and Student Affirmative Action Programs for the Nine Campus University of California system. Before joining the Education Trust, Haycock, Katie Haycock served as Executive Vice President of the Children's Defense Fund, the nation's largest child advocacy organization. Please join me now in extending a warm UTEP welcome to our good friend, Katie Haycock. Well, thank you, Diana, for that uh, O2 warm welcome. And I am, it's, it's my real, privilege actually to be here at an institution whose work I have admired for so long, both your incredible work with local public school districts, but also the very thoughtful work that's gone on right in this institution to try to make um, this university the very best it can be for the students that you serve. What I want to do, though, for the next, I don't know, 40 minutes or so, is drag you outside of your institution. We're going to take a little walk together through some data that will help put the work you're doing here in a broader national context. Um, and just a quick word about the data before I begin, and that's I'm going to go way too fast for those of you who are numbers freaks and like to write the numbers down. So just know in advance that all of what I'm about to show you will park on our website uh, later on, and I'll show you how to get there. 
So let's take a look at the numbers. As I think many of you know, over the past 25 years or so, we've actually made a lot of progress on the access side in higher education. Every single year of the, of the last uh, 30 or so, the number of students going on to college has actually gone up. And when you look at students um, who are graduating from high school in America today, within a year or two of graduating, about 70% of our high school graduates are now in some form of post-secondary education. And when you look at the numbers, three years out, four years out, five years out, we're very close to, uh, to 80%. The good news is that college going is going up for all groups of young Americans. This is a look at the numbers by race. As you can see, patterns generally upward. Here are the data by family income. As you can see, improvements for both low-income students and students from high-income families. But, and this is very important, but the college going has gone up for students of color. The gains among white students, as you can see here, have been greater. Over the last 25 years or so, college going has gone up about 13 points for African Americans, about 12 points for Latinos. Meanwhile, about 22 points for white youngsters. What does that tell us? That the gap that separates students of color from white students is actually wider today than it was when we began all this 30 years ago. And though college going has gone up, uh, as I showed you for students from low-income families, low-income students today are still not going on to college at the rate that high-income students were 30 years ago. Access, of course, isn't the only issue, too. There's a very big question of access to what. And you don't have to look at that chart very, le uh, very long to see the pattern. Basically, if you look at the numbers for Hispanic and African American students, as you can see, far more concentrated in the two-year college sector and in the four-year for-profit sector, far fewer in the public four-year uh, and private four-year sector. And I don't know if you've been following the recent data on for-profit uh, success rates in the for-profit sector, but it is very worrisome to see that roughly one in four African-American and Hispanic students now who's starting college is actually starting in the sector where they're least likely to succeed and most likely to accrue lifetime debt. And what about graduation? Those numbers, of course, aren't very pretty. This is a look at college graduation numbers um, by race for four-year colleges. And here are the numbers for two-year colleges. Again. You don't have to look at that very long to see the problem. Result, though, when you add up all of this, is that we have very different rates of degree acquisition for different groups of young Americans. For every 100 white children we start with in our kindergartens nationally, somewhere around 37 or 38 end up with at least a bachelor's degree. For African Americans, the numbers are slightly more than one half that. For Hispanics, as you can see here, only about one third that. And when you look at the data by family income, the numbers are even more frightening. If you look at American families that are in the top economic quartile, those are families where the household income is about $80,000 a year or above. Look at their children around age 24 or 25. What you'll learn, as you can see there, is almost 8 out of 10 of those young people already have at least a bachelor's degree. But if you look, on the other hand, at American families from the bottom economic quartile, Families like many of the families right here in El Paso earning $30,000 a year or below. Look at their children at that same age. What you'll learn, as you can see there, is only about 10% have that same bachelor's degree. You know, we're asked by educators all the time, what are you trying to suggest there? The, <clears throat> the answer is really pretty clear. What the data suggests is that unless you and I are somehow prepared to argue that children from upper and upper middle income families are about eight times as smart as children of the poor. This is about as clear a signal as we have in American education that something's going pretty seriously wrong in these two systems of ours, K-12 and higher education, because that is precisely the result we're getting at the end of the line. More about eight times the results for children from upper middle and upper income families that we're getting for children of the poor. So that's what the numbers tell us about where we're at right now and where we've come. The question, of course, is what's going on underneath those numbers? 
Now, there are a heck of a lot of people within higher education who would like to believe, and like everybody else to believe, that the patterns that I just showed you are mostly a function of lousy high schools and of stingy federal and state policymakers. And it's important to say in advance that people who argue that are not entirely wrong. As I think many of you know, low-income children and children of color in this country continue to be educated in schools where we spend less on their education, where we expect less from them, where we actually teach them less, and where we assign them our least well-educated and least experienced teachers. Now, the truth of the matter is, in the last decade or so, we're making a little progress in attacking that problem, especially in our elementary and middle schools, as you can see here in both fourth grade reading and in fourth grade math on national exams. Results are going up for all groups of kids, and the gap separating poor kids from middle class kids and kids of color from white kids are, are narrower today than they've ever been before. But though we're making progress at the elementary and middle school level, we have not turned the corner in our high schools. Overall achievement levels at the end of high school are flat, and the gaps between groups are actually wider today than they were in 1990. So when people say to you, preparation is part of the problem, you say, yeah, you're right. Preparation is, in fact, part of the problem. It is also true when people say that government support for financial aid is part of the problem that they're not all wrong. Interestingly, over the last decade or so, both the federal and state governments have been increasing the number of dollars that are set aside for student financial aid. In fact, those increases have occurred at such a fast pace that they're actually about as much as was necessary to cover the increased cost of going on to college. But here's what changed along the way. What changed along the way was who we were spending those dollars on. There's been a big shift, as I suspect all of you know, away from need-based programs toward giving funding over to students who actually have no financial need whatsoever. And the result of that is there's been a you know, big diminution of the buying power, power of things like the Pell Grant, which as all of you know, have been the signature federal program to help low-income students go on to college. And if the new Congress has its way, believe you me, this is gonna get a lot worse than that. So there's been problems at the federal level, but the reality is while they diminished their commitment to the Pell Grant, what did they do? They opened up these massive tuition tax credits and tax deductions, the dollars of which go disproportionately to our most affluent families. So we're spending more at the federal level on student financial aid, but more of those dollars are now going to students who have no financial need whatsoever. And the same thing is true of state grants. Basically what states are doing across the country is diminishing them, the number of their dollars they're spending on need-based aid, increasing the number of dollars that they're spending on so-called merit aids. What you end up with is programs like for example, the Hope Scholarship in the state of Georgia, where you have poor people buying lottery tickets to send the children of rich people on to college. Not exactly a smart uh, public policy. So in fact, not only is preparation part of the problem, but so too is government aid. And it's easy in higher ed to point to these two problems and say, see, that's what's going on. That's why we're having less success in both, on both the access side and the success side for low-income students and students of color. What that misses, though, is the fact that colleges and universities are themselves, it turns out, very important actors in this drama of shrinking opportunity in this country as well. For one thing, as I suspect all of you know, most institutions of higher ed, especially our richest institutions, but most institutions have something called institutional aid. Those are dollars for financial aid that they decide how to spend. They decide who gets them, right? And sadly, when you look at the trends in institutional aid, what you see is the transition from institutional aid for the students who most needed it toward institutional aid for the students who need it least, right? Who actually don't need it at all. 
has been more pronounced than the, than the transition in either federal or state aid. This is a look we did a few years ago. We're in the process of updating. But basically what you see in institutional aid, these are private institutions. Over that eight-year period, the number of dollars they spent on low-income students went up by about $1,700 per student. Meanwhile, when you look at students from the highest income families, over that same period of time, their investment went up about $3,500 per student. But sadly, even in the public sector, though the dollar amounts are smaller, the trends are exactly the same. We've been making much bigger increases in dollars for students from high income families than we've been making in students for, from low income families. And that, by the way, is true even in our richest, most prestigious institutions, our public flagships and other public research extensive universities. These institutions, as I hardly need to tell you, are the richest institutions, uh, public institutions in America. They, in fact, their students get more money in student, student financial aid from them than they do from either the federal or state government. What that means is that had they chosen to do so, they could have used those resources to shield students from low-income families from the effects of the fast rising cost of going on to college. The sad truth, however, is that they chose not to. Instead, what did they do? Hugely increased their spending on students from the most affluent families. Back in 1995, these institutions were spending together about $76 million on students from families above $80,000 a year. Today, they're spending $761 million. <clears throat> tenfold increase in expenditures on students from the highest income families. Those institutions collectively today are actually spending about the same amount on students from the highest income families, those above $115,000 a year, as they're spending on students from the lowest income families. In what universe, I would ask, does that make sense? So it's not all about student preparation or about what government does the choices that colleges make about what to do with the resources they have also play a hugely important role in determining who comes to them uh, and who doesn't. Moreover, the same is true, it turns out, about college success. What colleges do day in, day out, also turns out to be very important in what, whether students actually graduate with the degrees they're seeking or not. Now, warning, for the next few moments, I'm going to focus on the dread iPads graduation rates. I know you all think they're flawed, and they, in fact, don't tell us everything. But they do tell us, by and large, about how institutions are doing with essentially their easiest students, right? The ones who come full time right out of high school. Mm -hmm. So, what do you learn when you look at that source? You learn a couple of things. When you ask the question nationally, well, what proportion of the kids who enter college, four-year colleges, right out of high school, and they attend full-time, what proportion of those get a four-year degree in four years? Answer to that is 36%. When you extend the data out to six years of entry, that proportion rises to about 57%. And if, in fact, you go beyond these cohort data and look at graduation from any institution, the numbers grow to about two-thirds. So of the students who start out full-time, about two-thirds um, end up with a degree within six years. But that's the average. What's important to know is that underneath that average are institutions with very different success rates. Um, and this, in fact, is a, is a display of graduation rates for every institution in America, public and private. What do you see when you take a look? Well, down there on the left-hand side are a set of colleges and universities in this country that consistently, I mean consistently, graduate fewer than 15%, in some cases fewer than 10%, in some cases fewer than 5% of their students with a degree within six years. Over on the right-hand side are a set of institutions that consistently get more than 80%, more than 85%, sometimes more than 90% through in six years. Now, it will not surprise you to know that some of the differences between those institutions are clearly attributable to differences in student preparation or in institutional mission. In other words, institutions that are getting those high success rates are by and large 
very selective, right? They have very well-prepared students, very few poor students, very few students of color. Not surprising, they get quite high graduation rates. Down on the other side, where you saw those very low graduation rates, you have lots of ill-prepared students, many of them poor, um, <clears throat> and struggling with lots of other burdens. So some of this, pure and simply, is about that. And in fact, if you take all the things that we know about institutions and students and can measure, you can find a way to explain about 70% of the differences among institutions in terms of their student success. Which again leads people to believe that the only way to improve student success is to what? Send us better prepared students. But it turns out that when you dig underneath those averages, one thing is very clear that some colleges in America are far more successful than you would guess given the statistics on who they serve. Why is that important? Well, <clears throat> when we started our work, um, and I think Susanna will remember uh, back in those days, we used to get higher ed and K-12 people together and we would say, you know, for the first conversation, bring your data, right? Well, the K-12 people kind of knew what to do, right? Their data had been out in public for a long time, and so they bring their numbers in, they bring their grad rates, they bring their achievement data. And we'd say this, ask the same thing to the college people, and they go, data? What do you mean data? And we said, well, why don't you start by bringing in your graduation rate data? So they dutifully go get it. Then we'd sit around um, the table at the first discussion like this, and the college people would put their data on the t table and the K-12 people would look at it and they'd go, holy cow, you're meaning, uh, you're telling us that of all those students we send us, and we're sending you our best, by the way, you're graduating like 15% of them? And the higher ed people would all say the same thing. They'd say, yeah, but that's kind of about what institutions elsewhere in the country that serve similar students get. And the first time, or second time we heard that, we thought, oh, okay. The 460th time we heard that, we thought, hmm, I wonder if that's true. We used to hear that a lot on the K-12 side, right? You'd go, you'd visit an urban school, you'd ask the principal to look at the data, they'd have a proficiency rate of like 2%, and you'd say, oh my God, only 2% of your kids are proficient, and they'd all say the same thing. They'd say, oh, well, that's kind of about how other urban schools are. And they don't say that anymore because they know it's not true. And our question was, well, is it true in higher ed? So we ended up building a website that some of you have seen called College Results Online that basically takes all the measurable stuff we know about colleges and puts them together. And you can go on that and you can find the grad rates and other inst uh, information for any institution you want. But you can also see how that institution does compared to the 15 or 25 institutions most like it. In other words, it serves roughly the same kinds of students with roughly the same kinds of resources. So again, what do you learn when you do that? You learn that some institutions that have exactly the same mission, exactly the same focus, and serve exactly the same kind of students get far better results than others. Let me just give you a couple of examples. These are institutions that many of you would recognize. These are big, highly selective, mostly flagship institutions very large, as you can see, very well-prepared students, very few poor kids, very few students of color. So you would guess, since they have roughly the same kind of students, roughly the same kind of resources, and roughly the same mission, they would have pretty much the same success rates, right? We'll take a look at this. You've got Penn State University up here that consistently gets 84, 85, sometimes 86% of its students through with a degree within six years. University of Minnesota, that serves exactly the same kind of students, consistently gets somewhere between 55, 56, and low 60s. And when you look at the data on underrepresented minorities, you see very similar differences as well. Differences not explainable by the students, but rather by other differences, right? <clears throat> These are two other institutions, Florida State University, University of Arizona, that also serve very similar kinds of students. Very similar in terms of selectivity, very similar in terms of size, very similar in terms of the poor kids and, and kids of color served. But when you look at their student success rates, look at the difference, right? And rates for underrepresented minorities, very different as well. If you look at Florida State, 
students of color actually graduate at rates slightly higher than white students. University of Arizona, they're significantly lower. Or another two institutions, University of California, Riverside, University of Illinois, Chicago, very similar institutions, very similar size. UCR actually has more poor students, more students of color, but has a significantly higher success rate than does University of Illinois, Chicago, and especially for students of color. It's not just research universities, though. These are master's level institutions. Again, very similar selectivity, very similar size, very similar numbers of poor students, but very different rates of success from the University of Northern Iowa. It consistently gets about two-thirds of its students through with a degree in six years. Tennessee Tech and University of Wisconsin-Whitewater, considerably lower. And one final set. These are historically black colleges that some of you may recognize. These institutions, as you can see, um, their students are, are far less well prepared. These are much smaller institutions. The vast majority of their students are poor. Yet, though they have very similar mission and very similar students, they have, as you can see here, wildly different rates of success from Elizabeth City in North Carolina that consistently gets half or more of its students through with a degree in six years to Coppin State, not far from where I live that consistently gets fewer than 20% of its students through a degree in six years. <clears throat> so the bottom line, I hope is pretty clear. So yes, we have to keep working to improve our high schools, and we have to keep working, especially right now, to convince government that need-based aid is what it's got to invest in. But the truth of the matter is we've also got to focus on improving what happens in our colleges and universities as well. We also, and those of you who are numbers people, know that we need to agree on a sort of broader set of metrics for evaluating inst institutional contributions to communities and states and for evaluating progress. The IPEDS grad rates, in other words, and I don't need to tell you, are not sufficient. So we've been working, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I, I want you to know there's been a lot of work done in the last couple of years to try to develop a set of metrics that better assess what institutions are doing. So yeah, you still want to look at um, success rates, but you also want to look at service to state and community. So we're looking on the access side at both freshmen and transfers and asking how well do the students that these institutions are admitting reflect the communities from which they're coming. On the success side, we're wanting to ask the question, how well do low-income students and students of color fare in terms of getting a degree compared to their non-low income and white counterparts. And on the, what we call access and success, you're wanting to look at graduates. So what do those graduates look like each year compared to the communities and states from which they come? When you look at metrics like that, a rating of one means an institution is serving its state or its community well. A rating that's more than one says you're doing a bang-up job, even better, way better than most. A rating of less than one um, means there's still work to be done. So when you look at UTEP, UTEP through that lens, and thank you, Roy, for the help with these data, um, what do you learn? So when you look at this institution, the freshmen that you admit compared to the freshmen um, or, or the high school graduates in the state of Texas, what you see, of course, is something you already know, and that is you are serving um, low-income students uh, and students of color in the state of Texas far more uh, than would be expected by their, their, um, uh, their portion of the state pool. Now, you want to ask a second question, and that is, so how are we doing compared to the community from which we're drawing more of our students? And there, the numbers are also very strong. Low-income students are actually represented in your freshman class at a slightly higher rate than they are in the graduating class of local high schools. Students of color at a slightly lower rate, but uh, a much better rate, frankly, than in most institutions. So what happens when you look at success? When you look at the numbers for so-called underrepresented minorities, in other words, Hispanics, African Americans, and Native Americans compared to their white counterparts, your rate ratio here, as you can see, is almost exactly one. In other words, you still have a small gap um, between your uh, students of color and your white students, but it's very small. 
when you look at students, your low income students, interestingly, they're graduating at a rate that is slightly higher than other students, something there to crow about. So when you look at your graduates compared to the state as a whole, uh, of course, you're graduating far more, especially Hispanic students, than is true of the state as a whole, and far more students from low-income families than you would expect, again, looking at the state as a whole. But even when you look at your region, as you can see here, also very strong numbers. Students of color slightly underrepresented in your graduating class compared to the high school graduates in your community. Um, uh, Low-income students actually slightly overrepresented in that class. So a lot there to be proud of. I, I could bore you with numbers from lots of other colleges and you would mostly see ratios that are down in the 0.6 and 0.7 and people are feeling good about those. So when you ask the question, is this institution serving the community that um, uh, that in which you're located, what's very clear here is the hard work that you've done over the last decade or two to be an institution that truly serves its student population um, is very, very clear in the data. Now, don't, don't get me wrong here. It doesn't mean you don't want to get those overall success rates up, right? And I know this is something you feel strongly about, both your overall graduation rates and your graduation rates for Latinos. Those stronger than many institutions are, I know, not as strong as you want them to be or as your community needs them to be. So what I want to do is share with you some of what we're learning from the institutions that seem to be out in front in both moving overall success rates ahead, but most particularly in closing gaps between different groups of students. And I think what you'll find is certainly true as I've learned more about what's going on here at UTEP, um, that most of this simply reinforces directions you've already set. So, first thing that you learn when you look at the unusually successful institutions is they are very focused on their data. They are constantly looking at the numbers, trying to understand what those numbers tell them, and they act on those results. University of Northern Iowa is an institution that I mentioned earlier that really got into this game before lots of other people did. What the provost there, and then provost, told us is, you know, in this internet era, right, the provosts are a little more accessible to students than they used to be in the old, uh, in the old days. And he told us he used to get lots of complaints. And usually he said, you know, I'd say, you know, students said, I can't get into this class, it's necessary for my major, but I haven't been able to get into it for two years and I'm frustrated, I can't move on with my major. And he said, I usually think to myself, they probably just signed up late, right? But he said, when you dig in, and he learned to do that, what he found in this particular case is the student had actually been the first to register for two years in a row, both semesters each year, but had gotten blocked out of the course because essentially there were too few sections offered. So what they learned as they began, what they call the kind of critical path analysis, is that sometimes, sometimes, you have just one too few necessary section of a class, and that creates blockages in students who are majoring in that area, that those students then go over and take courses in other areas that create blockages for others. So sometimes, just by opening up those obstacles, you can really begin to change the numbers. And what Aaron said, again, the provost, is the moral of this story is, when a student complains, you should actually investigate. Because when you solve the problem for that student, chances are you're solving a problem that is, uh, uh, that is true for lots of other students as well. And let me be clear here, and this is something I know many of you know, institutions that successfully improve their four-year or their five-year six, or six-year graduation rates don't just focus on that, right? You do, by the time you know what the six-year graduation rate for a cohort is, it's an autopsy, right? It doesn't tell you anything. What those institutions do is they focus on data from, from week one, right? From week two, from week five. They're looking at students all along the way and acting. I mentioned Elizabeth City, the historically black college in North Carolina. They are very much about that. They take attendance. <clears throat> Faculty members monitor that. They call the students when they're absent. Faculty advisors track absences. They look at uh, midterm grades. They, they intrude very aggressively, they monitor the data, when they act, when 
absences are spiking with one or two faculty members. Everybody on campus assumes responsibility for acting on these warning signs, and the results are pretty clear in their, in their own graduation rates. Number two, one of the things you learn when you look at colleges and universities is that while most colleges offer, undergraduate institutions offer maybe somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 undergraduate courses, usually there are about 25 to 35 of those courses that actually explain the lion's share of student enrollment and the lion's share of student failures. These are often the introductory classes that are taught by lots of different faculty members um, and have unusually high uh, failure rates. This is a look at DF and W rates in uh, introductory mathematics courses in a variety of institutions. Uh, but don't think this is just about math. Here are DF and W rates at, uh, at, at a variety of other institutions in other introductory courses. The good news is these institutions signed up with this National Center for Academic Transformation that really helps faculty members to kind of work through the redesign of introductory courses using technology where technology can help. Now the truth of the matter is some of this can in fact be about preparation. But when you look at the results of their efforts, what you realize is clearly not all of it is. A lot of times the design of these classes is just not uh, conducive to student success. University of Alabama has been a real leader in the course redesign effort. Um, and this is a look at their success rates in mathematics. This is for the cr first credit bearing mathematics course. They began their effort in the year 2000. So you see what happened before that. Their, their success rates were basically down in the 40%. But by redesigning the courses, by, by instead of talking at students about mathematics, by engaging students in these big math emporia and doing lots of mathematics and monitoring their progress, they have radically improved their results. They've moved their success rates up from the 40% to now above 80%. And by the way, they totally eliminated the black-white gap in course outcomes. Their African-American students continue to enter University of Alabama with somewhat weaker skills in mathematics, but because the redesigned course is so focused on fixing those problems, they actually have totally eliminated any gap in course outcomes. They have the same exact students they had before, the same levels of preparation for good and for bad they had before, but very different results. And you should know that as they moved out this course redesign process, process into other introductory courses at Alabama, they didn't just change course outcomes, they actually changed um, their graduation success rates and totally eliminated the gap between black and white freshmen in terms of graduation rates. In 2001, their black freshmen in Alabama graduated a rate nine points below white freshmen by the class of 2006. Same students were graduating at a rate two points higher than white students. So again, it begins to show you what a really focused effort to take on those big introductory courses can do when you actually follow through. Third, one of the things we're learning from the more successful institutions is they don't hesitate to demand and require of students the things the rest of us just advise them to do. Okay, um, these are two institutions that's, that have a lot in common. Um, San Diego State University and University of Houston. Similar institutions, similar enrollment percentages of Latinos, similar selectivity. Back in 2002, you can see the graduation rates for Latinos in those two institutions. But look at the change by 2006. Both institutions had brought about um, substantial improvements but San Diego's improvements far outpaced those at San Diego State. What did the leaders at San Diego State tell us was important in this success? Two things. One, making the services and supports that they had for students more coherent, the advising, the, the uh, tutorial, and so on. But the most important thing they said is making what used to be optional for students mandatory. Right? These are a lot of institutions that are doing things like making attendance mandatory, making participation in study sessions mandatory. And when, I know institutions get very nervous about doing things like that, but we are seeing a pattern across unusually successful institutions 
and getting very intrusive about this instead of just encouraging students to do the things that research tells us matter to their success. When you actually make them do it, it turns out success rates go up. Number four, I don't have to tell you guys about leadership um, because, well, for obvious reasons. But it, institutions that are really moving the needle, and you see this in study after study after study, what the campus presidents and what the provosts do is hugely important. It's about a clear message that it's not just about access, it's about success as well. It's about a regular vehicle for taking stock. Are we making progress and not? It's about looking at the data. It's about reporting on progress. And it's about acting on all that. And it's about leadership, as you know, that constantly walk the talk. In the end, what you see in leaders like this is what you all know. And that is leaders that are driven, driven by doing what students need rather than solely by what their employees want. <clears throat> Number five, and this is the final lesson, you know, the institutions that really succeed in moving the numbers don't ever give up, even after their students leave, right? Uh, University of New Mexico is a really interesting example of that. <clears throat> a while ago, their associate provost, a guy by the name of, anthropologist by the name of Dave Stewart, got to look in at the data, as I know many of you do. And what he realized is that despite um, what many people believe, that most of the students who left University of New Mexico short of a degree left in perfectly good academic standing, often very few units short, fewer than 30 units short of a degree. And so what he said is, you know, something went wrong there, right? And maybe, maybe we ought to invite them back. And maybe, just maybe, we ought to admit some culpability in their failure. So what they learned is what uh, many of you probably know, is that in this era of internet bill collectors, for about a buck sixty, you can get the current address of any student you ever, you ever uh, had. And they tracked those students down. They wrote them a letter that said simply, we see that you left without a degree. That's probably our fault, or at least part of it. And we're wondering whether you want to come back. And what they did is set up for those students several things. They set up a quick degree audit, so they showed them exactly what they had um, to, uh, to complete. They set up a red carpet service so that these students would get help immediately with any problem they had. They got first priority in registration. They limited it to students with a 2.0 or better and at least 98 credits. There were 3,000 students. By today, 1,800 of those now have degrees and many have gone on for graduate education. Again, not a horribly complicated idea, but it just says, you know, you ought to never give up because in those gems that you lost are a lot of students who with a little, uh, with a little help could actually get that degree after all. Now I know that none of what I told you is magic. None of it is this kind of secret formula. And I know when I share information like this with people outside of education, they tend to say just duh, right? So this is like mostly common sense. I think what we're learning though is that the institutions, and this is as true of school as schools, uh, unusually successful schools, as it is of unusually successful colleges. What's different about them is they're like common sense on steroids. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Katie, for, as always, a, a thought-provoking presentation. Are there any questions anyone would like to uh, ask? If you do, I'd like for you to go to the microphone so that everybody can hear you. It's always hard to be first. Anybody? Go to the microphone. Go ahead. get up for, to the mic because I don't think I need one. But mm -hmm. anyway, um, when you combine the different uh, explanations that you gave for the reasons why um, there are these gaps, um, you know, the, the stingy governments, the poor high schools and so forth, what is your overall explanation? Because as I, as I 
saw your information, to me, one ex possible explanation is institutional racism. But how would you describe it? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I don't tend to use that language mostly because I find it inflammatory, but you could, you could argue that essentially that's what happens, right? So what, what happens is sometimes because of, um, for conscious reasons, that people have attitudes about certain groups of kids. They don't think they can succeed, so they don't do much to make sure they do. So some of this is about conscious racial uh, attitudes or about attitudes that have to do with students who are growing up poor. My impression, however, is that it's less about sort of conscious racism um, or classism than it is about people who don't know any better, right? Most folks who go into education, at least in my experience, go into education to make a difference. But along the way, um, unless they had help in being unusually effective, they ended up not having as much success as they had hoped for. And when that happens to you, day after day, year after year, you have to blame it on somebody, right? And it ends up being easier to blame it on the kids than to look in the mirror. Um, and because we don't offer people who are not very successful much help at learning from those who are more successful, you can't blame them, right? Um, we don't actually do much to understand why is it that some teachers in K-12 or faculty members in higher education produce extraordinary learning outcomes, even for students who come in ill-prepared, and others don't. Why is that? But more important, what do they do? What exactly explains the success that some of us have and that others don't? And how could we go about helping the people who are not as successful to learn to be that so we can get out of this kind of point over there and into looking at the mirror? <clears throat> sure. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I think that was a great point on both sides, you know, how you explain that. Um, on that same note, why do you think that higher education is sort of afraid to be a little more exclusive? Obviously, um, not everyone even desires, much less needs to get higher education, like a, a bachelor's or higher. Um, why do you think not only are they afraid to be a little more exclusive, but also um, why do you think that society sort of demeans um, the opposite, like a vocational education? Sure. Um, there's a, sort of a lot of pieces of your question. Let me try to answer them as best I can. Um, first, I think in, in all honesty, most colleges don't hesitate at all to be exclusive and selective and to keep students out because it's a heck of a lot easier to look better um, if you exclude weaker students. And the vast majority of colleges in this country um, have been doing exactly that and more of that every year in order to drive their rankings up on the things like US News and World Report because you, you don't get any points, right, for serving low-income students well. You get all the points for being more and more selective. Even though we know that turning a student with an 18 ACT into a bachelor's degree is a lot harder work than turning somebody with a 30 ACT, we don't give anybody any points for that. So I would take issue with what you said initially, and that is most institutions actually are very comfortable excluding lots of people. But let me sort of talk about the broader economic situation. Uh, the, the reality is the way our economy is going, both here in the U.S. and internationally, students who don't have at least some post-secondary education, and I mean that by that a post-secondary education degree or, creden or, or credential, are essentially toast. Um, and so if you ask me the question, is it rational for us to be sending more and more of our students on to college? The answer is absolutely yes. What I cut out of this presentation because um, 
it was too long already, is the international data. So we used to lead the world in the proportion of our young people who had at least an associate's degree. We, <clears throat> we now rank fourth when you look at overall adults. We're 13th when, it, when you look at young adults. And the scariest thing for me is we are one of only two countries in the developed world where today's young people are not better educated than their parents. And we are the first generation in American history where that's true, right? For our whole history as a country is about parents fighting to get, give their children more opportunity than they did. So each generation had more education than the last, and we have flattened out while everybody else is going up. So both at the individual level in terms of opportunity, and at the group level, the national level, we've got to get more of our students into and through college. Now, does that mean all of them have to be in four-year colleges? No. Does it mean all of them need to be liberal arts majors? No, it doesn't. And we've got to get better at some of the career-oriented programs. We also have to remember that the world of work is changing so fast that if we prepare people narrowly, in six years, sometimes in five years, all that knowledge is obsolete, right? And so those jobs go away. So unless we get our people better educated generally, as well as in the specifics, they don't have a prayer and we don't need it as a country. <clears throat> yes? Good evening, uh, I'm uh, Joseph Escobar. I'm a, a student here in this uh, prestigious uh, educational institution. Yes. Uh, coming, uh, my background from the uh, Department of Defense, ah. and uh, I'm being always passionate to take care of my soldiers and to teach them, yes. even though they, uh, we say they are knuckleheads, you know, we say that, but it's a way to bring them to the yes. And, and make an excellent soldier, but we gotta teach them every day. Yes. As in charge. Yes. I'm coming to this institution, and I'm seeing as a student. My major is in uh, physics, biophysics, mm. with minor in math. We don't. They don't offer offer that one anymore. But I already got it. You know, and I just graduated from uh, EPCC uh, mm-hmm. as a, a computer engineering with 395 GPA. Wow. So it's a lot of work. And I've, I'm coming here, and I like to work with the people, mm-hmm. with the students, and uh, with, us, uh, with the professors. And I'm seeing excellent professors that go up there, and they show off how brilliant they are. Mm-hmm. And I love that. Mm-hmm. What I don't appreciate is they, they don't have the pedagogical resources mm-hmm. to make this transfer of knowledge from the professor who come and most of the time from other cultures to this other student who has a different culture and uh, doesn't know how to compete with the professor. Mm-hmm. So sometimes, uh, myself, I study a lot, you know? Yeah. And I appreciate all this organization, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's, um, a, it's a great organization, and I appreciate that a lot uh, Dr. Diana Natalicia because she lift up this university mm-hmm. and put together the both countries. You know, all this hot rate, all this stuff, went away, and she's doing a wonderful job. I want to uh, uh, give her an, an applause, please, because, yes, it is very important. And the uh, Hispanic uh, population is increasing in number of graduated people. And uh, I, I, right here is most of the people in that way. And I know a lot of people that are very smart. But when they come over here, and I have friends, sometimes they are uh, uh, scared. Because uh, at, right now, I just talked to a professor, professor, I need to turn in this uh, homework. Well, it's not my homework, it's your homework. Uh, uh, look your, uh, for your PA. Where is your PA? I don't care. You, uh, do I need to know? And I'm talking about PhD in math. You know, talking directly to the professor, to my homework right there, trying to turn it in. And uh, I needed to go and talk to them, and he is just very despotic. But I went and talked to the person or other person in relation to that. So the connection between the smartness of our plantel of professors, PhD, is great. We need to work a little bit more 
in supervising them and making sure they have the uh, pedagogical tools to care for those students. Because a lot of students, and I have my daughter and my son here, mm -hmm. <laughs> I care for them and I care for me because I went to war, I am a veteran of war, I, I went on first, the front line, and I went and came back alive. Thanks God for you guys, you know, so you can have a better life here. So I'm a veteran of war, and, and, uh, and actually I went to the war. But uh, I got to have faith in what I'm doing, love and passion, and also a lot of care and love for my soldiers. Is that why my soldiers came back alive? And we were losing 200 soldiers a day, you know, young soldiers. So how they can trust in you when they're confronting death? Because you, you teach them in a certain way, and they trust you in a certain way when you care for them. It's a, two ways. So I just ask the Plantel to supervise those teachers coming from other countries uh, for them to really care for the students because something that really made me mad. I'm an American, I love America, and I'm, I'm putting my life, life in the line of fire for America because when you love your, your country, you want everybody to be successful and everybody to get their PhD and be great in America and around the world. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Yeah. Well, thank you for your service, first of all. Thank you for that comment. You have the Dean of Science sitting right over there, and I saw her paying attention. I hope you'll get a PhD and come to teach here, too, because that, um, that kind of passion um, is something we all need more of. Thank you so much for what you said. <clears throat> yes. Hi, I have a question. There's often been a correlation between role modeling for students and, and their success. I was wondering if you found that um, in many of the institutions that are successful, you have a higher uh, percentage of faculty and mentors that represent the racial composition of the students within, within that university? Yeah, th that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I think the answer is Sometimes yes, sometimes not. Um, I, we've certainly, as we watch institutions, um, have certainly come to understand that it is really important for us to continue working and work harder on getting more, especially people of color, into the ranks of both advisors and faculty members. But, and this is a really important but, when you talk to students about the faculty members who made the biggest difference for them, it is not always somebody who looked like them. And what students teach us, when you ask them to talk about the faculty members who made the biggest difference in their lives, and they start talking about them, and then you ask about their race, it's almost like they have to stop and think, because there are certainly a set of both teachers in K-12 and faculty members in higher ed who become sort of transracial, right? Who connect on a respectful and personal level with their students regardless of their background. So that people are not of color should never be an excuse to say, well, I just can't do that part of the job because you sure as hell can. I'm wondering if you're in your comparative research, did you identify um, any of these institutions that had freshman preparation programs before the freshman class entered, like summer bridge programs, and did you come across that and were they effective? Yeah, well, that's a really good question, and, and uh, the problem, uh, first of all, we're, we're by no means the only experts in this. We're really uh, digging as fast as we can, but one of the things that's, one of the reasons it's hard to answer that question is almost nobody doesn't have a summer bridge program. Almost nobody doesn't have a student success course anymore. Almost nobody doesn't have some sort of uh, courses put together. So it's a little hard to tease out um, uh, what part of this actually works and what doesn't, but I'll tell you what we've come to believe, and even people who run things like the freshman year experience, who believe in their approach, and people who run the learning communities initiatives and believe in their approach, will always tell you it's not the approach, it's how well it's done, right? And if this is a part of an institution-wide effort to make student success a priority, almost any one of those strategies can be a powerful strategy. 
but if you're just what we call, Suzanne and I back in our California days used to call these things, these schools Christmas tree schools because they had one of everything. And the equivalent of a college is the Christmas tree colleges, right? They have a freshman year experience, they have learning communities, they have this, they have that, they have that. But if you ask, so what's the plan, right? How do these things fit together? Are you looking at your data? Are you adjusting along the way? The answer is usually no. So it's not necessarily about the things on the tree. It's about the tree itself, right? And how, I don't know if trees can focus. I think my metaphor is about to get ugly here. But, but, but it's really about the institution's focus. It's about its message. It's about the data. It's about, it's about adjusting when things aren't going right. That, that makes way more of a difference than adding more, one more ornament on the tree. This one right here. Okay. Okay. When you were talking about um, the data that you asked mm -hmm. the institutions to bring your data, mm -hmm. um, it was mainly on your chart what was success rates and cost, or actually it was income. But I think, for example, uh, they kind of go hand in hand. I mean, what are the repercussions or the consequences of not graduating them other than those two things? Because for example, when you asked them, they were like, well, what do you mean data? And they had never really stopped to think about and compare themselves to other schools. Right. But all of them said, oh, we're doing pretty much as well as everyone else. Right. And then they found out, well, maybe not so. Mm -hmm. So um, what are the consequences of underperforming? Because obviously, even if you don't graduate, you still paid money and they still made money from you. Yeah. So. Well, the consequences in this economy are very serious to the students, right? Because they end up with debt and, and no credential. And again, in this economy, more than in any other time, the credential matters, right? And, and I'm, don't, don't get me wrong here, I'm not suggesting that spending some time in college, even if you get no degree, isn't good for you. It can be. But again, in this economy, the payoff really is to a degree. So. That's, that's why working on success is important. Um, and that's why the institutions that make a difference know that if they serve more low-income students who have to work, who have family obligations, who are more poorly prepared, it's going to be harder. And that the policy structure responds to those students and those institutions by giving them less money than the rich institutions is insane. But that's what the policy structure does. But it's really about um, what you do with, with, what, with the students you serve, right? That that's what, in the end, is going to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, in, in most, this is, generally speaking, it's a state issue. In most states, there are no consequences. In fact, the institution actually, arguably, if you can replace all your students to leave with brand new freshmen, it's like trench warfare in World War I, right? And people come up out of the trenches, they get mowed down, it didn't matter because there was a group of soldiers behind them. So, um, but, but, uh, so more and more states are putting into place accountability systems, the smart ones don't just focus on what the number is, they focus on improvement over time. Um, more and more are doing that, but still not many. I mean, because the policy structure has essentially accepted this idea that it's really all about the students. Yes, sir. Is the recipe for better graduation rates due to a dedicated student retention and counseling program or is it a culture of success by the instructors themselves that they monitor their own yeah, uh, that's, students? That's a, that's a totally good question and I, d I don't know that there's a simple answer to it, but I think what we've come to believe is that no matter how good the advising structure is, if there's not a culture of success on the instructional side, if, in other words, the faculty don't see it as their responsibility to make sure their students get through, no amount of good advising will fix that. Can good advising help? Absolutely. 
but, but the, the fundamentally important relationship is the instructional one. And if that's going badly, it's very hard to fix the other side. Both are important. One, however, is central. <clears throat> so thank you all very much. Thank you again, Katie, for just a great presentation. Always appreciate hearing you, no matter how many times. Uh, we'll now have a reception out in the lobby area, and there'll be an opportunity to speak with Katie and each other, and perhaps you'll spark some really exciting new ideas. Thanks for coming. <laughs>